Uh, moving on to 6.2 or 9.06 a.m. item, consideration of update on COVID-19. And today with us, we have Dr. Charlie Evans. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. And also we have Director Pomeroy with us. The floor is yours. Good morning, board. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present again on COVID-19 and our current response. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Evans um, for a, a quick note and then to Sarah, our epidemiologist for the epi update. And then I'll be coming back on to uh, provide new information on testing sites and vaccination sites. So thank you, your board. It's all yours, Dr. Evans. And you're still muted, Dr. Evans. Hear me now? Perfect. Great. Thanks for inviting me to come speak to you today. Um, uh, I, this is uh, my first role in acting as your uh, interim health officer. And to begin, I, I would really like to have Sarah give her epi update because the information on the update really focuses and frames what I wanna talk about. So if we could have Sarah present her epi update first. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Okay. So things are changing rapidly in the state and in Lake County. On the left, we're looking at the daily test rate per 100,000. Lake County is this darker black line. You can see in the recent weeks, there's been an increase in testing in Lake County. At the same time, you see this dramatic increase in testing positivity from mid-June, down from a low of about 1% to the most recent testing positivity is 17%. This is higher than the county has experienced um, throughout the pandemic. You can see during the same time period, really from about mid-June, the state has had a dramatic increase, though not near that of Lake County, from about 1% to nearing 6%, the most recent time period reported here. So we're gonna look at the daily case rate and the, the dramatic increase in new cases in a couple of ways, because I think it's really important to understand what's happening in the last couple of weeks. So on the left, first we're looking at the daily case rate per 100,000. Lake County is in this black line here. Again, you can see from your low in mid-June, about one per 100,000. So the most recent seven-day average is 31 cases per 100,000. Lake County has had the highest daily case rate in the state um, pretty much for the month of July. You can see the state is increasing as well, and I'm gonna share some of their numbers, but the, obviously you can see the slope of this line is increasing rapidly in Lake County. We did, unfortunately, um, re, there was a, a 65th COVID death within the last week, and so we are now reporting 65 total COVID deaths in Lake County, and you can see that represented here. So I really want us to look at this daily case rate to understand what's happening now and what we can expect over the next month. So here we're looking at the daily case rate of Lake County here in orange. You can see at the peak in the surge, the state, the surge, uh, the peak for the state and the peak um, for the county in the winter. For Lake County, it was just under 70 per 100,000. And then we saw the dramatic decline into the spring and had relatively really low case rates through the spring um, until mid-June where we started to see that line start to creep up. And so what's different between this slide and the slide I just showed is the previous slide was a seven day lag. Here I'm removing that seven day lag because I want you to see that while I just reported 31 per 100,000 for Lake County, when I remove that lag, we're looking at 50 per 100,000 daily case rate in Lake County. Um, and we are particularly concerned about the slope of this line. Um, we are seeing increases throughout the state um, and I've highlighted some of your neighboring counties, um, Sonoma and Mendocino in the red and the orange, and you can see that they're experiencing increases as well, but nowhere near to the extent that Lake County is. 
One last way of looking at it, because I think it's helpful to look at it by just raw numbers as well. This is the epi curve that's been presented to the board and community previously. Taking you back to looking at the peak for Lake County in the beginning of 2000 and beginning of the year, about a 300 cases per week. Well, for the week that just ended this weekend, the week of July 18th, we have identified 250 cases. I expect we'll continue to see this number change and likely increase as more lab results are received. Um, so again, this is just showing you again, mid June to present, I expect we will continue to see the number of cases grow over the next couple of weeks and the next month, um, given um, the trajectory that we're on. I would not be surprised if next week we're reporting near 300 cases um, for this current week. Um, so just wanted to give you some more information about recent cases. So this is cases that we opened at the health department from July 1 to July 26th. I ran this last night. That's 551 cases or people with lab confirmed uh, COVID. One in three of these recent cases live in Lakeport. One in five live in Kelseyville and 89 or 16% live in Clear Lake. You can see the rest of the communities listed here. Um, continues as it is statewide, continues to be in younger people ages 20 to 44. Half of the cases are among 20 to 44 year olds. This has been pretty steady for us throughout the pandemic. Um, they make up 26% of the population, but 51% of the cases. Children and adolescents are less likely to be infected, about 12% of the recent cases, and still doing a good job of protecting um, people 65 and older, 8% of the recent cases compared to 22% of the population. Um, so I wanted to share the latest data on post-vaccination COVID infection. So I'm gonna slowly walk through this table on the right to be really clear about what these data represent. So here we're looking as of um, uh, two days ago, July 25th, the number of fully vaccinated Lake County residents was over 28,000 people who were fully vaccinated. At the same time, we had identified 68 cases among fully vaccinated individuals. So this is someone has been fully vaccinated, they've had their J&J &J, or they've had their two doses of the other vaccines and they've tested positive for COVID after that, they're, they're fully vaccinated. So 68 people. So that is 0.238% of people who are fully vaccinated in Lake County have, have had a post-vaccination uh, COVID infection. So said another way, on the left, 99.76% of individuals who are fully vaccinated have not tested positive for COVID in Lake County. Um, quickly, just want to highlight as right we see, we've, we've been here before, as we've seen the increase in the daily case rate, we're gonna lag by a couple of weeks, we're gonna see an increase in um, hospitalizations. So here we're looking at um, two days ago, there were 10 COVID hospitalized patients in Lake County. Um, you can see at the peak in the winter, um, it was a high of 12, that 14 day moving average. You can see the lag behind our daily case rate, increasing number of hospitalizations, as it has been throughout the pandemic, noting that this does not include Lake County residents who are transferred out of county. At the height of the surge, we were tracking, we were better able to track that, and we saw that about 50% of patients at this time were being transferred out of county. I cannot speak to the percent of people that are being transferred out um, right now, but know that it only includes people hospitalized in Lake County. And then you can see on the left, again, um, two days ago, the last report, three COVID ICU patients and this line increasing and how it compares to the 14 day average during the winter surge. Um, so before I go into the latest data on vaccination coverage, I wanted to highlight some things statewide. Um, 
daily case rates are going up state right wide so about two per 100,000 in mid June um, up to about 14 per 100,000 last week again Lake County is well ahead of that with the seven day lag about 31 per 100,000 but looking at just the most recent time period I'm seeing about 50 per 100,000 um, um, which is significantly higher than any other county in the state um, I think the second point is really important the state is reporting um, the daily case rates between fully vaccinated individuals um, and unvaccinated individuals. So we're seeing a big difference between those two populations. The state's reporting about 13 per 100,000 daily case rate among unvaccinated individuals and about two per 100,000 among vaccinated individuals. Um, I was looking at our, our data and seeing that there's about seven times there's people who are unvaccinated are about seven times more likely to be infected with COVID than people who are fully vaccinated in Lake County. Um, that's an estimate where we're looking at that data closely, but that's what I'm seeing and that's similar to what the state is reporting. Um, I think everyone is well aware that Delta is spreading and in every region of the state in June, it was about 50% of sequence specimens. The state is reporting that it's closer to 80% now. And just to note, like we are seeing in mid-June, the state epidemiologist reported that there were about 150 hospital admissions a day for COVID patients. And early last week, she saw two days in a row of 500 hospital admissions a day. Okay, so uh, briefly gonna highlight the coverage in Lake County. Um, and just wanted to share that the, there's been recent UK, uh, Canada, Scotland, and US studies that looked at the second dose vaccine. If people had two doses of the Pfizer or, Pfizer or Moderna, their effectiveness against the Delta variant. This is really, really great news it's 96 percent effective in preventing hospitalization um, which as we've discussed all along is one of the key goals um, in the response um, it's 87 depending on the study 87 or 88 percent effective in preventing symptomatic disease and 79 percent effectiveness in preventing lab confirmed infection infection the vaccines are performing very well against protecting against hospitalization and death and very well against protect, protecting against um, severe disease so how are we doing in terms of vaccination coverage in lake county um, 52 percent of people 12 and older among the eligible population are fully vaccinated that's over 28,000 people um, that's compared to 63 percent of Californians who are fully vaccinated um, one thing that I just want to note here on this slide if we think about the surge the increase that's happening in Lake County right now is there's still 41% of the eligible population that's unvaccinated. And that doesn't even include, you know, people under the age of 12 who are not yet eligible. So when you include them, over half the Lake County population is unvaccinated. And so if you think of the tools that we have to really affect that slope of the line, um, they are vaccination. But if everyone tomorrow wanted to get vaccinated, who was unvaccinated, wanted to get vaccinated and got their first dose. And then three to four weeks later, got their second dose. That doesn't fully take effect for two weeks after that. And so we really want to encourage to be looking at continuing to get this large percentage of the population vaccinated, but also other things that we can all do to prevent infection. Um, that we know that works particularly among age groups, this, this working age or this 18 to 49 age group where nearly uh, three in five people remain unvaccinated where the majority of cases are occurring um, to prevent them from getting sick, to prevent the 30, you know, the older population and more vulnerable people from getting sick with comorbidities. Um, that's really critical and important right now at the same time um, to really address this surge that we're seeing right now, um, the things that we all know work, physical distancing, wearing masks are really important. I'm um, concerned that we will continue to see 
um, dramatic increases unless we, um, in the short term, in the short term, we certainly will. It's important to do masking and physical distancing and um, vaccinating over the next month is gonna be really critical in terms of preventing um, new infections in the, the late summer and early fall. Um, I'll stop there and turn it over to Dr. Evans. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, so thank you, sir. That's a great report. And I know we would all like to believe that um, we were through the, the COVID-19 pandemic and that it's all behind us, but unfortunately it isn't. And as Sarah pointed out with her uh, presentation very clearly, we really have a house on fire and it's time that we all huddle together and put that fire out. Unlike a year ago, we now have the tools to do that. Uh, you know, we are lucky enough to live in this country where we have an abundance of vaccine that is available to all who are eligible. Um, next week, I'm going over to Kenya where I started the clinic years ago and um, do some work over there. <clears throat> Only 2% of their population is vaccinated and it's just wreaking havoc in that countryside there. But we don't have that situation here. We have an abundance of vaccine uh, that we can get out to people. And we have an abundance of PPE to protect ourselves when we are forced into close contact with others. And we just need to get down to it and, and use those, those tools. So um, I asked myself the question, why is Lake County leading the state in reinfection? And um, I believe it's multifactorial. It's not just one, um, not just one thing. Um, some of those factors we can control and some of them we can't. Uh, first, I think as Sarah pointed out in her discussion, the surge really started right at, at the middle of June. So what happened in the middle of June? In the middle of June, uh, we released the mandate on masking and uh, unvaccinated individuals were still requested to mask when indoors, but vaccinated people were not requested to continue masking. And I think the result is that most people did not mask. <clears throat> and so if we're 50% vaccinated, then we should see 50% of people masked. And I don't think we're seeing that. So we can't uh, understate the, the value of masking uh, when in crowded places or when indoors. Second, I think uh, we're seeing a bigger increase because we're lesser vaccinated. So. I think the numbers Sarah presented were 52% uh, of our population is vaccinated and of the, the risk group from 18 to 49, it's only 35%. So that's a little more than one in three in that group. And uh, those are the people who are out and who are active and those are the people who are getting infected. Um, so thirdly, um, and, and that's contrasted to the state average of 63%. So, um, you know, you're going to see a, a higher rate if you're less vaccinated. <clears throat> Thirdly, and, and we can't know yet how big a, uh, a factor this plays, but it's, it's the new variant in the mix. And um, we don't know for sure how many of our uh, infections are the Delta uh, variant. Um, with time, we will, um, but I can only guess that we're seeing a significant number of infections from the Delta uh, variant. And I, I want to speak a little bit about variants <clears throat> because I think it's really important for everybody to understand how the variants come about. And, and I'm sure many of us want to know when they're going to stop. So for those who follow the news carefully um, back in the, in the height of the big surge in the winter, you remember the, the B117 variant, which was referred to as the alpha variant, uh, which was the one that came from England. And it caused havoc for Europe, leading to big surges in infection, big surges in death, uh, because the, the vaccines weren't uh, available at that time. Um, <clears throat> this virus also caused 
a large rate of infection and a big surge in Michigan and Minnesota in this country. But oddly, we didn't see a big surge in the rest of the surrounding states. It, it did surge up in Canada. We don't know why it surged there and not in the rest of the states. But we didn't see the big spike in B117 that we thought we would. Again, you know, we don't understand everything, but we do understand a lot more about this Delta variant, which is much more aggressive than the B117 variant. The B117 variant was 40 to 65 percent more aggressive than the mother virus. The Delta variant <clears throat> has 1,000 times the viral load that the mother virus has. So what that means is when you cough out a, uh, a nice big cough and you spread virus particles out, there's going to be 1,000 times more virus particles with the Delta uh, variant than with the mother virus. So another way of thinking of this is that we know this virus is airborne. So if you're indoors and say you're at the opposite end of a building where someone is smoking, but the airflow is toward you, you can smell that smoke. Now, if instead of that person smoking, that person was coughing uh, Delta virus out, you would be also breathing in that virus. So that's the way this, this virus is spreading. And that's why it's so important to mask indoors. Um, <clears throat> so when are the virus, the, the virus variants going to stop? Well, the answer to that is not until the whole world is vaccinated. And, you know, the, the world is the petri dish for this virus. It's not just the United States. It's not just Lake County. Less than 10% of the world is currently, currently vaccinated, <clears throat> leaving probably 8 billion people more to go. It's going to be a long time before all those people are vaccinated. And as long as there are unvaccinated people for the virus to find, it will continue to mutate. And, you know, what, what the virus needs is a host that is, is able to accept it, and that's a host that isn't vaccinated. So I hope this makes it abundantly clear that <clears throat> this virus will find you if you're not vaccinated. Uh, although you can't do much about vaccinating people in the rest of the world, China, Africa, and South America, um, we can do a lot about that here locally. And I think it's important for us to act locally and do all we can to decrease the mortality that this virus is going to wreak on our, our home communities. I want to say something about schools. Um, I, th I think we fully expect the schools to reopen in the fall. And if your child is of the age that they are eligible for a vaccine, I strongly encourage you to get them vaccinated. Although children <clears throat> rarely become critically ill, with COVID-19, some do. And so it's important to do all you can to protect them. And when in school, they should wear masks until such time we have a high enough vaccination rate that the infections of COVID are curbed. So one of the, the areas of good news, uh, if there is good news that we can report, is that although we're seeing uh, another surge, the mortality in the surge is not as high as it was back in the winter. And that is because we vaccinated a lot of the people who are, are uh, most vulnerable to, to COVID-19 and to death from COVID-19. Those would include those over 65. And if you remember Sarah's uh, graph there, those over 65 had a much higher vaccination rate. Um, it includes the immunocompromised, those with diabetes, those who are overweight. So if you or your loved ones are in these categories and are not vaccinated, you are our first priority because you are the ones that are most susceptible to um, bad outcomes or death from COVID-19. So what can we all do about this? I know we're all fed up with masking and, and sheltering at home and isolating. But in Lake County, we're facing one of the biggest surges we've yet seen. If we do nothing, this situation will devolve and we will see additional unnecessary debt. Last weekend, last weekend, the hospitals were all at capacity. The ICU beds were full, the med surge beds were full, all of them, both hospitals. So we're already at that point 
of critical overload. We know how to stop this virus and we should practice it. Businesses should keep up their, their shields to protect their workers and have hand sanitizer readily available. They should have little stickers on the floor that keep people six feet apart. These things really make a difference. Employees and patrons of these shops should continue to mask until our infection rates drop significantly. Again, masking makes a huge difference. What we risk if we don't is further overwhelming our healthcare system, and that's gonna put the mortality rates above the half percent and could go above the 2% because we won't have the capacity to treat them. Fortunately, right now, we do have the capacity in that we are leaning on, on hospitals uh, to neighboring counties and we transfer these sick people out. But if we keep on surging, those options will also become overwhelmed. And so it's really important that we take this very, very seriously. There is a clear path out of this pandemic and, and you all know what the answer is, it's vaccination. We all need to participate in it. And if those of you who are not vaccinated, you have to rethink it because it's, it's vital for the, the uh, long-term outcome for so many people in this community. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the myths around vaccination. So the Rural Association of Northern California Health Officers came up with a, a uh, vaccine myth uh, statement, and it's been circulated on social media and also in papers. But uh, it was well done, and I thought it was worth uh, repeating the six myths that they discussed there. So the first myth was, I had the virus, so I won't get it again. But to the contrary, uh, reinfection is well documented. And the COVID-19 vaccines result in much higher protection than immunity from infection itself. So even if you had COVID-19 or think you had COVID-19, you're much more likely to be protected if you get the vaccine. The second myth is getting the vaccine is worse than getting COVID-19. Plus, I'm young and healthy. Well, um, I, I've worked in the hospital since the beginning of the pandemic, and getting COVID-19 and getting sick is a bad, bad disease. People suffer, they drown in, in water in their lungs, and it's, it's a terrible, terrible thing to watch. So getting the vaccine might give you a sore arm. Uh, occasionally, there's a complication of it, but it's very, very rare. And a vaccine uh, has a much more predictable outcome than the infection, regardless of your age. Myth number three is the vaccine is experimental. It was rushed into use. Well, actually, the technology used for this vaccine is decades old. It's not experimental. And we now have hundreds of millions of people who have experienced the vaccine. Uh, with good outcomes. It's highly effective. We've, we've not had vaccines that are this effective. This, this vaccine is more effective than polio and many of the other great vaccines that people have long trusted. And this, this is, it's remarkable that we have a vaccine as effective as we do. And in this country, we have the Pfizer and Moderna, which are really the model vaccines across the world. And um, we're so fortunate to have access to them. Um, myth number four is the vaccine will make me sterile. Um, actually, they've done sperm counts on people. Those haven't been effective in the phase three trial of the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. They had 36 uh, pregnant women that were randomized to controls and vaccine groups, and there was no difference in outcomes. This vaccine doesn't affect uh, fertility at all. And myth number five is the vaccine will mess with my DNA. Someone is trying to rewrite our genetic code well, actually, COVID-19 vaccines can't change your DNA. All they really do is give you lasting immunity to the COVID-19 infection. And myth number six is we don't know the long-term consequences of these vaccines. And in fact, we do. You know, most of the side effects of the vaccines occur in the first six weeks. After that, there's very few. Uh, contrary to the infection, you know, some reports said that up to 30% of those hospitalized from COVID-19 will have permanent long-term effects from the infection. That's not something we want. So I, I wanna move back to how do we conquer this pandemic? It's, it's a little bit about playing the odds. Um, here in California, we have a lottery. 
you know, if you, if you play uh, lotto, you have uh, less than one in a million chance of winning. <clears throat> Yet many of us buy the tickets because we think that and we might draw the lucky ticket and we could live more comfortably. Well, living without COVID is, is living comfortably. And that's where the COVID-19 data really gives us a great deal of information. We know now that if you get vaccinated, there is a 95% chance you will not get the virus. That was very clearly shown by Sarah's slide. If you're one of the unlucky 5% who do become infected, uh, you may get sick, but you, very few of you will require medical attention and still fewer will require hospitalization. So I read a statistic last week and it, 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 they vary, but uh, there was one statistic in a county where 99% of those hospitalized were not vaccinated, only 1% were. To me, these are the odds I want for my, myself, for my family, for my loved ones, for my community. And I strongly, <clears throat> strongly urge you all to get vaccinated. The Delta virus is on the rise and it, it has been found in Lake County. And my guess is that it plays a significant role in, the, in our surge. It, it may be what's fueling it. And the vaccine will protect you against this variant. We know that. By becoming vaccinated, you, you do not only help yourself, but you also are protecting your children who are too young to get vaccinated and you're protecting those who are immunocompromised. Because immunocompromised people, even if they are vaccinated, can get quite ill. All that data and all the science of these vaccines show that they're safe and they're effective and they protect us from the severe consequence of COVID-19. And those, those graphs that we just saw show there's no, no time to waste. If we all get vaccinated tomorrow, we're still gonna see a big surge next week. COVID-19 is looking for hosts who are not yet vaccinated. And I'm sure if you're not vaccinated, it will find you. So I strongly encourage you all to act promptly. And with that, I'm gonna give it back to uh, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Dr. Evans. Appreciate all the uh, data and information uh, provided as well. Any comments or questions from board members? I have a couple comments and questions. Go for it. Um, thank you, Dr. Evans. I really appreciate this presentation today and um, really putting it, uh, all the data into context with what we're dealing with um, locally in our county. Um, I just wanna point out that I've heard the Facebook feed for this section of the meeting is not live. And if we could just clip this COVID update and get it up for people to watch later, um, I think, I think that's necessary for everybody to see, as well as the slide, Sarah's slides. Um, so we can just get, get this information out to as many people as we can. Um, I'm wondering, I, so it looks like the vaccination rate for the 12 to 17 year olds is 19%. Is that correct? Sir, I can defer to you on that. Yeah, let me take a closer look. I think it's about 20%. Yeah, so 81% of people 12 to 17 are unvaccinated. And we have school starting in roughly three weeks. So it's really important for families to consider right away getting their children that are eligible for vaccines um, to get that done right now uh, before school starts. You know, they're, they're still going to be um, not fully vaccinated after school begins, but it is time to make that push right now. Um, have we seen an increase in vaccination rates in the past week? We're seeing about, it's very slow. Right, for the last two months, month and a half, we see about a 1%. You know, Last week I reported 51%. This week I'm reporting 52%. It's very slow. Okay, so hopefully next week we'll see a bigger jump, hopefully. Um, and one other um, issue that's kind of coming up is we have some large events that are planned. And people are looking for guidance on whether or not to continue with these events. 
Um, some are outdoors, some are indoors, um, but with the rate of spread that we're experiencing, Dr. Evans, can you give some guidance on, on how these um, events should be carried out or potentially canceled? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, you know, at this time with such a high rate of infection, I would strongly discourage any indoor large functions. Um, you know, outdoor is much safer where there's good ventilation. And um, some studies suggest that, uh, you know, if you socially distance and you're outdoors, you're fine. So I, I would certainly move to uh, postpone those that are indoors. But to those that are outdoors, um, you know, I think particularly if people are careful and they, they mask, you're much better off. And, um, okay, so that's good information if it's outdoors. So if you're in an outdoor event that's very crowded, your suggestion would be that people should mask in distance? Yeah. You know, it, it, we all saw those graphs. We're right back to where we were um, last winter. And, um, you know, last winter we were masking and being extremely careful. And that's, that's unfortunately what we have to do right now when we're at this high risk uh, setting. There's so much COVID in the community that people have to take every precaution they can to protect themselves, even if you're vaccinated. Right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. That, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. So I will just uh, make a quick statement that I am fully vaccinated, probably got vaccinated about, I don't know, three to four months ago. Um, I did it for what I believed was for my best interest, the best interest for me, for my family and for my community. Uh, I would urge you not directly to go get vaccinated, but go talk to your pr primary provider about vaccination. Uh, I, I'm not going to know what your background or your medical history is. Your medical provider will uh, have those conversations. Don't just decide what Google or anyone else uh, have those private conversations with your medical provider. They will know and understand what your needs are and understand what is happening in our community as well and be able to provide the best guidance. So I, I would say please make sure and have those conversations with your medical provider um, so you can make those decisions uh, with better information uh, or the best information. If there's nothing further from supervisors, Supervisor Simon. Yeah, I uh, just wanna thank you for the presentation today, uh, both Sarah, Dr. Evans, and obviously Denise. And continuing this um, thing, you know, as far as our updates that we're giving here at the board, at this point, you're either on one side or the other of the vaccination conversation. And so what we're doing is continuing our information so we can educate and try and get the information out there, just as Supervisor Sabatier said, Chair Sabatier, uh, so you can make your decisions, how to protect yourself, your family, and make those decisions. Uh, I myself too, and I said it last week, um, was uh, vaccinated with the Moderna vaccine and will continue to encourage that with my loved ones, my family members, and folks surrounding myself, and also our employees that we're responsible for. Uh, there is an opportunity there, but it is your own decision. And so we'll continue on that path. The ultimate goal that we all know is to continue to have our businesses open and to function in the best way that we can so we can work through this pandemic. And we'll continue doing that. There are, like I said, passionate folks on both sides of this. You make your own decisions for your families, but we're gonna to continue to provide the information and to be educated as we move through this process. So I, I myself, I said it last week too, I am not a doctor. We'll look to gather the information and to make those decisions. But as folks said, well, what are you doing? Well, I made the decision and I felt like taking the vaccine was the right thing to do. And I've done that. So as we say, um, you know, and I said it last week, you'll see as, as we move through this process, how it affects folks. So not only asking folks to do what they need to do, uh, but also did it. So I would, would not ask someone to do something that I would not be willing to do or put myself or my family in that place. And so we'll continue with this messaging. So I want to thank everybody from the public health department, uh, all of our hospitals, as we've heard, uh, you know, there are quite a few folks that are in the hospital. 
uh, you know, I wish everybody uh, good luck and, you know, good health to get out of the hospitals. And um, not only do uh, I employ uh, all of our employees here at the county that we're talking about protecting, but also have business and, and a tribe that we're protecting on, on my behalf. Uh, and we'll continue to give that message of please take an opportunity to get that vaccine. The worst thing we want to hear is losing a family member uh, just over some information that may or may not have been correct. But um, please have those conversations, as Chair said again, with your health provider and hopefully move in the right direction. But other than that, if you're not going to, please wear a mask. It is inconvenient, but it could save your life, other lives, and that's all that we're asking. So thank you. Thank you for those words. Any further comments? I do have uh, Director Pomeroy. I, I missed that her hand was up. And so uh, before we open it up for the public, Director Pomeroy, floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Sabatier. And thank you, Dr. Evans, um, for your update and Sarah for all of your work on your epidemiology. I uh, just want to give a few updates to the board on testing and vaccination. Um, Dr. Evans has written a letter that will be going out to all of our medical providers today, asking them to up their efforts in both testing and vaccination. Um, in prior months when we were at our height, um, a lot of the clinics were doing additional clinics, so we're, we're, we're seeking that partnership again with them. Um, the public health department just finished um, doing all the schools or having testing and vaccination at, not testing, vaccination at all the schools. We will continue to work with uh, uh, the schools as it gets closer to get more vaccinations done. Starting this week, starting tomorrow, public health will be doing um, vaccination and testing at our health department. So tomorrow, Wednesday, from 8.30 to 11.30, you'll be testing and Thursday, from 8.30 to 11.30 will be vaccination opportunities. And then starting next week, which we will do a press release later this week to give the actual times and stuff, we'll be doing testing on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and vaccination on Mondays and Thursdays. That'll be at the Lake County Bevins building. And um, I do have our director of nursing on. She can probably give more information on the details. This was just set up in the last two days. So we are working really diligently back at our, pulling some of our plans out that we did earlier in the year to, to get these sites up and running quickly. In addition to that, we still have the OptumServe site down in Lower Lake. They do testing on Monday and Thursday, and they do vaccination on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. So that is 18 and older. They are currently not giving out Pfizer, and Pfizer is the vaccination for the 12 to 18 years of age. We will be offering that here at our health department. Our message to the public is exactly what Chair Sabatier was saying and Dr. Evans, please see your provider. If you think you are sick, call them. Um, let's try to stay out of the ED, it's your providers can handle this they have the vaccinations, they have access to the testing, please seek out their medical input for your own health. Um, with that, the additional sites are still up so you can get vaccinated at the majority of the pharmacies in Lake County, your providers, the health department, often serve. Um, so please take care of yourself and your family and your loved ones. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I know you offered for uh, Carolyn Holiday to speak, but because our time is uh, overlapping many of our other items, if it's possible to put that information out in a, a press release or social media, um, that, that way the information is readily available. It's not easy to take notes as we're speaking right now here in the meeting. Uh, but for time's sake, we're gonna open it up to the public and get started there. Um, I have one hand in, uh, and I'll get to the boardroom in a second, uh, phone 4627. Let's go ahead and start in the Zoom room. Good morning. This is Tom. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, Tom Slade here. Um, I had a comment and then some questions. These cases that we keep hearing about, to my knowledge, are based on the PCR test that has been, to my knowledge, discredited by the World Health Organization as being meaningless for diagnosing COVID cases. And I sent an email that uh, Jessica probably got this morning, and there's much, much more than that. But uh, 
So you can take a look at that. And it seems to me it brings this whole report into question because it's all about cases. And uh, one, of, one of the commenters uh, spoke, uh, moving on, things that work. And I've been looking into this. I don't need to be a doctor to read and think and ask questions. And as far as I can tell, there are uh, possibly treatments and preventatives for COVID, HCQ, ivermectin, zinc, vitamin D, especially in combinations. Now, it's controversial, but there's a lot of doctors saying that they are using it and that it works and that can you know, uh, possibly eliminate the need for ho hospitalization and save lives. I don't know, but I would ask you know, what the, from the health department, what is their comment? What are their thoughts about that? Thank you for your comments. And we're going to go ahead and take all the comments and write down questions, and then we'll go ahead and uh, answer them all at once. That way we can uh, uh, just make sure that we get to everybody in time. So those uh, comments and questions have not been lost or ignored. Uh, we will get back to you on that. Uh, let's go ahead and open it up for Will Tuttle. Uh, yes, OK. Th yeah, this is Dr. Will Tuttle. I'm uh, again, publicly questioning the official narrative about COVID as it's being rolled out here in Lake County uh, because it's a direct attack on our constitutional rights and freedoms as well as on our health on every level. I'm also speaking on behalf of thousands of people here in Lake County who feel the same way I do about this but don't speak up at these board meetings because they believe, perhaps rightly, that it's few to do so. I was born and raised in Concord, Massachusetts, the birthplace of the American Revolution against British tyranny, and I was raised to honor memory of the townspeople who in 1775 gave their lives in the first battle of the Revolutionary War at the Old North Bridge in Concord. And with their blood and their courageous example, they helped to lay the foundation for our Constitution, guaranteeing our rights and freedoms that the government is only by the consent of the governed. And yet in less than a year, we have seen these precious freedoms and rights seriously eroded by the fraudulent narrative of a medical emergency, forcing people to shut down their businesses, wear masks, distance from each other, and leading to sharp increases in suicide, alcoholism, drug addiction, and spousal and child abuse. The big news lately is that just a few days ago on July 21st, completely ignored and buried by the mainstream media, and not, not discussed here at all today in this meeting, the CDC announced that it is directing all COVID testing labs in the United States to phase out the PCR test, which has been until now the gold standard used to diagnose people with COVID. No reason is given by the CDC, but perhaps it's due to the huge number of lawsuits which will reveal what many honest and heavily censored health experts have been saying from the beginning, which is that it's a completely bogus test for diagnosing any disease, especially COVID. This means that the patient that we've been hearing that have driven the mandates and the vaccines, everything, are all based on completely fraudulent foundations. Can you please pause for a second? Mr. Tuttle? COVID, it's a Mr. Tuttle? Mr. Tuttle? Mr. Tuttle? I'm not trying to interrupt you, but we can't mask hear you. Wearing. There's never been any double-blind controlled studies showing that mask wearing is effective. In fact, in a recent poll, a recent published review of 17 main studies that have been done on mask wearing, the conclusion was, quote, none of the studies established a conclusive relationship between mask use and protection against viral infection. There are many damaging effects of mask wearing including harmful hypoxia or low blood oxygen levels, hyperpenia or high carbon dioxide levels, as well as nose, throat, mouth, and lung infections, and many other harmful effects, including psychological disconnectedness from others. So uh, in closing, I want to say that I feel that we should emulate the American Indians who taught that we should live close to the earth, that we should breathe and savor the air. We should rejoice in the beauty and kinship of nature and animals. We should open ourselves to the healing power of the sun and the sky, we should treat each other with respect and kindness, and we should question all the directives coming from the exploitive government power centers in Washington, D.C., and Sacramento, which the Indians learned from bitter experience were deceitful, deceptive, Three minutes are up, Mr. Tuttle. All this fear is toxic and completely unfounded. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have phone 6478. Uh, hello, uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, my name is Madeline, and I think uh, it was uh, very good what uh, somebody said in your crowd that we have to look at it and not to be right away vaccinated. 
because we should see both sides. And I think it's a, it's missing. We hear your side, I mean, the side of uh, precious vaccination and mask wearing, distancing and all that for a, a whole long time. But there is nobody uh, there who talks from the other side why not to be vaccinated, why the masks don't work and all these things. So how can we make a wise decision? I'd like to ask you this question and uh, be answered and have somebody there who also speaks about the other side at length and not just three minutes. That's not long enough. Some people of us are very, very knowledgeable and they know a lot about why not to vaccinate, why uh, masks don't work and they don't have enough time. And you have so much time to explain why to be vaccinated and kind of with a little power in, in behind to uh, push it on us. So I ask you this question. We like to have somebody represented there who can talk at length about why all these things don't work and why it's so much it's untruth what we hear. Thank you. Thank you. I see no further hands up on the attendees. I am going to call on Randall who tried to make a comment multiple times. This is your this is your item that you wanted to speak on. If you don't raise your hand, I'm going to move on to the boardroom. I believe you were unmuted two seconds ago. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes, you have three minutes. Okay, thank you. I want to thank the opportunity to address uh, Lake County board members. Thank you for this opportunity. I also want to uh, give you a set of fa facts. I'm only dealing with facts from the other side of death. And I've been gracious enough to come home. And I'm sitting here and I come home with information. I want to give you a play-by-play -play of what happened. On July 7th, uh, a friend of mine got his second COVID test. I had connection with him on July 8th. And when I saw him, I said, are you okay? He said, Randall, I got the t my second test and I'm not feeling well. He had a fever blister on his mouth. And see, I had let my guard down because they said uh, for people that were fully vaccinated, didn't have to wear a mask. And so I let my, I was not vaccinated. I was very anti-vaccination. And so with that said, when I saw him on the 7th, on the 9th, 24 hours later, I was hit with COVID-19. He, we did tracing. I've been working with public health uh, we traced it down. That was the only guy it had contact with. And he had his second shot, and he was unmasked and was able to shoot the droplets, and I took him in. And I winded up in ICU on 710, and I was there for 14 days. I'm at home, and I just want to tell you, people have free will. They can choose whether they want to be vaccinated or not. But our county, our responsibility is to protect our community. We need mandatory masks, whether you're vaccinated or not. If you, if you don't want to wear a mask, stay at home. My wife went to Walmart yesterday and Rite Aid, and she was the only person in both stores you have a mask on. If you're gonna do business in Lake County, Walmart, Rite Aid, and all these people, they have to protect our community. They have to protect our people. They have no service if you don't have a mask. We will still get the revenues. People will, will mask up, they will still go to the store and buy the products, we will get the revenues. We did it with seat belts. Seat belts save lives. 
Your three minutes are up. Asking will save lives. Thank you very much for Thank my you. opportunity to share that with you. Thank you for the comment. Next is Savannah. Um, I just wanted to say a big thank you to the Board of Supervisors and to Public Health. Um, just thank you so much for the transparency. I know everybody's working really hard. I know this is a difficult situation. Um, I myself am in education and it's been a really difficult road uh, managing COVID and managing how to keep our students safe and how to keep our staff safe. So we just really wanna say a big thank you to you guys for all the hard work you're doing and all of the effort that you're putting into to keep the community safe. Thank you for your comment. Next is Leonardo Rodriguez. Hello. We can hear you. Okay, awesome. Hello, my name is Leonardo David Rodriguez. I'm the student trustee at Mendocino Community College. And I just wanted to comment on uh, education and what COVID has really done to education. It has completely thrown off so many students and, you know, we thought vaccination would help us with that. But, you know, in a county that's only 50% vaccinated and a Delta surge, it doesn't look like schools should start reopening again. Especially when this variant looks like it affects younger people even more. And as someone who was enjoying their college experience, to have it taken away after so much work, was really hard, but we adapted to it and, you know, we've been dealing with it. And I would just ask of people that, you know, don't plan on getting vaccinated to think of not only of themselves, but of their community and their, their families, their future. And to think of students like me who are trying to get a higher education and can't even go to their colleges of which some people are paying, you know, thousands of dollars to attend. <laughs> so I just urge people to get vaccinated to Thank do their part. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And that's the last hand in the Zoom room. I saw a couple hands here. Let's go ahead and come up to the microphone. I, I, I'm not going to call on people. Please just come to the microphone and The only reason I call people in the Zoom room is because their names are actually printed right in front of my face. I don't want to get your names wrong. Thank you for your consideration. It's very much appreciated, all your remarks. And um, to the scientists, Dr. Evans and Sarah, uh, I have been familiarized with a lot of that information, and a lot of it is bought by the industries, um, Pfizer, Moderna, and manipulated data. Uh, to that effect, I would like to say that 12 American healthcare professionals, among a growing many more, have had their careers and lives threatened, social media platforms censored and deleted and been labeled by the CEO of the United States Incorporated as disinformation dozen, all after sharing the truth and evidences that they've come across in their work that have conflicted with and exposed the media-driven fear pandemic organized by the companies whose science you say you trust. The CDC is a vaccine company whose guidelines have been blindly trusted as sound science, destroying livelihoods and cognitive and social development and basic rights and freedoms around the world until now. This was all based on inflated case counts as a result of the RT-PCR test designed using gene sequences of the 2003 SARS coronavirus because to this date there is still no SARS-CoV-2 viral material available, only synthetic nucleic designs thereof. The WHO tacitly admitted this January that all tests conducted at or above 35 cycle thresholds are invalid. Why would I come across the county with this information I've gleaned with data, science, st studies, and statistics up to my eyeballs that I've poured over for the last 16 months when I don't have children or feel any pressure to partake in any gene modification experiment or cover my airways for anyone and don't ask that of anyone I know or anyone I don't know? 30 years, I have loved and lived science. Today, I love and live in truth. Maybe the genocides I descend from are, s are smaller in numbers than that from which you hail. Does that negate the wisdom and trauma I inherit with it and its indication that with censorship comes medical fraud, malpractice, and tyranny? Maybe it's trite to you that I've faced censorship for sharing information about the Tuskegee experiment or that I've used my adult privilege to grow organic produce for my community to, in exchange for WIC certificates or often less, all to find myself without land for the last two years. What's trite to me is faith in false scientists funded by the same organizations who passed out the smallpox bioweapons on blankets, claiming that they were trying to help. 
What a privilege it must be to make policy on 16 months of 97% false positives from a class one recall test that failed full FDA review and had its emergency use authorization revoked. I ask you, in standing with the Chilcotin Nation of the Universal Supreme Court, the Lenny the Nappy, the Lakota, the Blackfoot, the Pomo, the Paiute, the Huape, the Suwannee, the Cherokee, the Algonquin, the Taino, and all the children of Turtle Island and far beyond, is human civilization really on the path of progress? Or is human society being further degraded with each passing day? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next hand. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I get people's names? Oh, we didn't get your name. If we can please get your name. Thank you for reminding me, Joanna. Thank you. Ahava Rose from Middletown. Thank you. Next. Go for it. Go for it. She's just taking a stroll. <laughs> My name is Joan Moss. Um, I speak out quite often. I wanted to let you know that Dr. Evans' voice was clear. The lady who just spoke was going so fast, I could not hear her. And the woman who spoke up for Lake County, I could hear her half the time. I'm getting a hearing aid soon. Things might change. I'm wondering if the report, the official report, is in print anywhere. So those of us who might be a little hard of hearing can understand every word. This time the words were bigger and I could, under, I could see them. It was improving. But I think the sound production of the woman from Lake County um, needs to be as good as the sound production from Dr. Evans. Thank you. Then we can hear what you're saying. Thank you very much. And I uh, believe that this video will be replayable in the near future. Uh, and also, if you need further uh, data, just go ahead and contact me and I'll make sure you get that data. Anybody else in the boardroom have a comment on this item? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, I please. I did just want to make a comment. I think that we also have hearing devices, correct, that are available to yeah. attendees here. So oh, thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Oh, I, just, I just wanted to say that, that there is an opportunity before the meeting. So uh, there are hearing devices. If you're having trouble, please uh, let us know. And the administrative office will help you with that. So and I see Sam holding something up in the back there. So okay. thank you. Your, your microphone is not on. Well, I was going to say the volume is the same when it's projected in the room, but people's pitches vary. Yeah. So. And, and unfortunately, with Zoom, different equipment does different things. Uh, one of our speakers, there was a lot of rubbing on the microphone or some kind of uh, other noises in front. So we can't control everything that happens uh, with so much equipment being used. Uh, but we seem to be done with public comment, so I am going to bring it back to the board. Uh, I just, um, before I ask uh, Dr. Evans to uh, make any response to some of the medical stuff that was uh, stated, I, I, I do want to make some corrections. I did look up uh, some of our uh, death reports uh, from last year. Suicides are down in Lake County, not up. Do they still happen? Yes, and if they're personal, they are absolutely debilitating to friends, families, and anyone connected. But there is not an increase in suicide, nor at one point we heard from our sheriff that there was not an increase in domestic violence either. I'm not sure what that overall number looks like for the full year in comparison, but we were getting information. So what you read in the national news does not always equate to this is what's happening in our local communities. And so we need to make sure to not use the Simpson paradox of looking at the aggregate and thinking that it's happening exactly the same here in our own little county where we have different numbers and different reactions and different ways of uh, living and a, and a unique culture as well. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just stop there. I, I, will not make any uh, slight comments to, so as to not to distract from the real conversation. Uh, Dr. Evans, there was some medical questions, uh, something about the PCR test and also the availability of medicine. Um, I'd rather you take that, uh, take a look at that and respond versus uh, my response to that. 
Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So um, first, Tom mentioned that the PCR test had been discredited. So, you know, I have to differ with you, Tom, on that. I'm an ER physician and have been for 37 years. Um, we use PCR tests in many different modalities, and it's an extremely sensitive test. It tests the DNA of the virus. And the only time it falters is when the test is not administered correctly, but it has been a life-saving test that has allowed us to detect the COVID-19 virus on numerous individuals and know whether to hospitalize them, know whether to treat them as outpatients. It's been a life-saving test. And you were correct that there are other treatments that people can do to prevent getting uh, COVID-19. And you mentioned vitamin D, zinc, vitamin C, and all these uh, are, have been looked on favorably. There have been studies done on them. Um, you know, I am um, one that's not a big proponent of promoting drug companies and uh, vaccine companies for the business, but for the science. And um, taking vitamin D, taking zinc, taking vitamin C is certainly not harmful and may be helpful. And um, in fact, I will admit that during the heart of the pandemic, I took vitamin D, zinc, and vitamin C when I was seeing COVID patients every day. And I was lucky enough, probably because I was wearing my mask 100% of the time, not to become infected despite treating hundreds of COVID patients. So uh, with regard to Mr. Tuttle's comment uh, about the um, mask wearing is not protective, uh, to the contrary, there are numerous controlled studies looking at masks and it, it varies according to the type of mask too. So, you know, wearing a bandana is not as protective as wearing a surgical mask. Wearing a surgical mask is not as protective as wearing an N95. Masks work. And the, the stronger the mask, the more protection you get. And I highly encourage people to continue wearing masks. I did agree with you about your Native American comment, living closer to the earth and savoring the air. You know, every time we can do that, um, good for us, because that's what life is living. Um, uh, to um, Randall, I'm really sorry that you became infected. Um, I, you know, have seen your story so many times and I, I really applaud you for speaking up uh, for the mask. And, and I think that if more people were to wear masks, you're right, we would ha not see the surges in infection that we're seeing. Um, to uh, Madeline, uh, uh, you said, let's not rush into this um, with regard to vaccinating. Um, you know, we're, we're over a year into this pandemic and we've had vaccines for uh, about nine months. Um, I had a patient last week who came in, she was in respiratory failure. Her lungs were a whiteout on the chest X-ray. And as I was getting her ready to go to the ICU, she asked me if she could be vaccinated, you know, I told her, you know, it's too late for you to be vaccinated, you're infected. And I think it's really important that we're not rushing into anything here with the vaccines. We have nearly a billion people vaccinated. This isn't about making the, the vaccine companies wealthy. This is about protecting you. If you go to any ICU in this state, you're gonna see COVID patients on ventilators. Um, Many of you have experienced death in your family and the numbers are huge, but when it's somebody in your family, it, it's, it's horrible. It's just horrible. I lost a family member to COVID. Leonardo, um, I really sympathize with you and what you're going through with, with trying to educate yourself. And I completely agree that wearing masks is, is the way out of this. And um, I certainly hope that we can get people vaccinated and get schools to be safe. Uh, that is our goal. And those are the notes that I, I took. Um, the woman who spoke fast and I didn't get her name. Um, she was talking about vaccine companies. Uh, uh, 
doing things that were uh, more in the interest of their company. You know, vaccine companies makes vaccines and, you know, they're for profit companies, but I, I can't tell you how fortunate we are in this country to have this kind of technology widely available to us. As I mentioned, I'm going over to Kenya next week uh, to work in a clinic where I, that I helped start 30 years ago. They have nobody vaccinated in that clinic and they barely have oxygen. You know, we need to take advantage of what we have here and we should be, we should be proud that we have that technology to offer to our, our people. So um, my message is vaccinate and wear your mask. Wash your hands and wear your mask. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Evans. Uh, the, the last uh, thing that I will say is just two simple things. One, uh, some gentlemen spoke about uh, the American Revolution leading to uh, Constitution and the creation of our country. Uh, please do a little bit more search on the American Revolution without mass inoculation by George Washington on the army. There would not be a win for America in the revolution. Uh, make sure to look into that so you better under so you can better understand why inoculation is useful. Uh, and then also representation of the other side. Uh, it's hard when the other side is not in science to have them represented. Um, and and I, I will go ahead and go with my uh, um, unfortunate remark. It'd be like asking our diversity group to have a position for a bigot. Uh, I just don't think that that would make for a very good conversation. Um, we want to move forward, not be stagnated in where we are moving. And if there's any further comments from the board, then thank you very much, Dr. Evans. Thank you, Sarah, Director Pomeroy. Uh, thank you for your update. And uh, because of our status, I'm sure that uh, we will have these updates a little bit more often than we've had in the last few months. Um, and so we will see you soon. Thank you.